Thanks, Jen. Well, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm particularly excited that I have the opportunity today to interview John Borthwick. Um, John is the CEO of Betaworks, which is a New York City company that got our attention in the last year for investing in, acquiring, and incubating interesting companies in the Twitter ecosystem and other smart startups like Tumblr, User Voice, and Chartbeat. Before Betaworks, John was the SVP of technology for Time Warner. John, welcome. Hello. So, John, on the Betaworks website, it interestingly says that Betaworks is a new kind of media company. What does that mean? So, um, you know, we think about, you know, normally I sort of jump over questions like that fairly fast because. Um, the real answer is that it's, it's evolving, and we're learning what that really means. But um, given Doug Rashkoff's talk, you know, he talked about how the changes that are taking place um, demand, beckon, summon new kinds of company structures. And that is exactly what we thought when we started Betaworks. So uh, we thought that there was a whole set of changes that were taking place that had to do with real-time social public data and a whole set of companies that were emerging. And what was different is a lot of those companies were connected at the data level. And so could we create a company that could interface with that ecosystem in a more logical, meaningful way than a, let's say, a, a, a VC or a fund structure or than a single company structure. So Betaworks, uh, this today, we refer to as a new media company or sometimes a new medium company um, because we do believe there's a new medium or aspect of the medium that's emerging. And it's, it's a collection of 22 or so loosely coupled um, uh, entities that are all individual companies. I, I love that. You know, you said to me earlier that um, backstage that one of the things that distinguishes the companies is that they're connected on the data level rather than on the biz dev level. That's a really profoundly different way of looking at a collection of companies. Um, and it, it sort of points the way towards the future a little bit. I so, think so. I mean, one of the, um, in my old job at Time Warner, I saw a lot of attempts at synergy yeah. um, at the business development level where, you know, somebody said, you know, Time Warner Cable, thou shalt work with uh, AOL or, you know, uh, AOL, thou shalt work with Warner Brothers because you do online, you do video, therefore make online video work. And um, that didn't work too well uh, for a whole set of reasons. I think it was very top down, but also because people really weren't thinking about users, products, and data. And so they weren't thinking about what was actually the uh, sort of what needed to be created. They were thinking about sort of the business parameters of what they wanted, which was a successful online video thing. So a different world. So um, yesterday, Tim talked about Facebook's ability to turn off links to and from other sites. And you wrote in a blog post recently, the post was called Lines in the Sand, that, quote, users, developers, and companies need to demand clarity around the layers and transparency into the business terms that bound the layers. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how we hold Twitter accountable, what that statement means for Twitter as they're emerging as a, a dominant platform in status updates. Sure. So, um, you know, the post that you're referring to, I, um, I pushed out about uh, 10 days ago. And I, I, I don't blog much, but I sort of do these long-winded blogs periodically. I do them about once a quarter. And it was really, it, it came out of some of my experience in the old, old days in the Microsoft antitrust trial and looking at Google and thinking about Google today and the sheer market power that Google has. Um, and then thinking about Facebook and Twitter. Um, I, I mean, I think that there needs to be, um, and you know, Tim was talking explicitly about Facebook, I can refer to Twitter too, is that the more transparency that there is um, for all the constituents around, for, ranging from users to developers to people who are participating, people who are placing content into these networks, the more transparency there is in regards to what are the sort of terms of service or the rules of the road. Um, and terms of service sounds like it's, it's privacy. It's privacy, but it's also the business terms. And it points again to what Rashkoff was saying, you know, who owns this data, right? And so the Facebook guys have, for a whole set of design reasons, 
but also for a whole set of business reasons, they've asserted the right that they own a lot of the data, if not all of the data, that you pass through the network. So even if you discontinue your Facebook account, um, you know, the images that you shared are still technically owned by, they, they assert rights to that. Um, in Twitter's case, Twitter looks at the world differently, I think, and sort of sees everything as, as a link to something else. So TwitPic may assert some rights, or Flickr may, wherever you host your photos, but Twitter itself is just pointing a link. So it's a different architecture, and I think it's a more op open architecture. In the blog post, I sort of refer to a, a Jeff Jarvis point, you know, do what you do best and link to the rest, which I firmly believe. But I think that generally sort of more transparency, some rules of the road about data in, data out, and, um, and how we share data, it's actually going to help accelerate the emergence of these new e ecosystems and companies, because we'll actually know what we can and we can't do. Is there something more we can do other than trust that Twitter won't be evil? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, in the blog post, I, t I, I, I just finished Ken Letter's book, and I took the don't be evil thing, and I said, okay, I think that we need more than that. Um, and so, I, yes, I do believe we need more than that. You know, some, somebody said, you know, can we get these companies to sign up to a set of principles? I don't know if there can be a sort of, you know, declaration of sort of open web principles, but if we can go that far, these are companies, they're businesses. Um, and so I, I think that to a great extent, the reason why these rules of the road are not established yet is the business models are not established yet. And so what these companies need, um, because I know it on my side, is that they want optionality, they want flexibility. And so they assert rights that may be broader than they would normally because they want the option to have that once they figure out their business model. So it's sort of a little bit chicken and egg because the faster we can figure out the business model, and I think that in the last five to seven years, we've been sort of so incredibly focused as, a, as on the web at using AdSense and as a sort of as a fairly blunt instrument to monetize everything. I think we've got to broaden the business models out and really figure out ways how to monetize more effectively some of the social media because then that in turn makes these businesses say, okay, you know, these, you know this is okay, but this is actually our territory. This is where we make our business. Right. Okay, so let's, um, let's talk a little bit about that broader web and about the, the Google model. Um, you were an AOL Time Warner deal maker and you were involved in the Microsoft antitrust case. Um, you wrote recently in that blog post that you think that it's likely that Google will face an antitrust suit. So let's consider two possible near-term futures, one in which they do and one in which they don't. In, in each of those scenarios, what does the world look like for the rest of us? What is, what's the impact of that? You know, from a user perspective or from a company perspective? From a company perspective. From people building companies. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, the... So I, I think that the world Google will run into an antitrust issue because I think the sheer scale of their platform and uh, the way it's monetizing and the breadth of it um, will, will drive them into a regulator. I don't know when it will be and I also don't know where it will be because if really the reality of the Microsoft antitrust case is that most of the issues came out of Europe, um, not the US, or well, most of the issues that have affected the actual business um, came out of um, came out of the European regulators, so it could be anywhere. Um, and I think that there's a lot of you know you can see a lot of these issues bubbling up that relate to whether it's the book deal or whether it's sort of um, uh, their monetization platform or some of the privacy issues, data ownership issues. As that moves across geographies, you're going to bunch of geographies who're going to say, um, you know, it is we're not comfortable with those set of data ownership rights that you're exerting over users and companies who are operating in my geography. And part of what you know, Google operates, or the premise similar to what Microsoft operated on, is a single platform. Is just you know, the moment you have to fork that platform um, you know, by geography, you get a lot of complexity. So I think it will happen. What does it look like for the rest of us? It's, um, 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 I don't know. It's, uh, that's a great question. It's, uh, I think that, I hope that it, I mean, one of the reasons why I wrote the blog post is I, I actually hope it doesn't, doesn't happen. I, I personally think it's pretty much, uh, it's, uh, it, it will happen, but I think that the, the last antitrust trial, I don't think that it, yeah, I was involved in the remedy part of the, f of the case, and um, where we were really focused on how can you f uh, design a forward-looking remedy, and I think government is uniquely open ill-equipped Ill to do forward-looking technology remedies. So um, I think government can end up doing a lot of things that 
can, uh, can actually have the unforeseen consequences of prohibiting um, or actually squashing a lot of innovation. Because right now, there is a lot of innovation that's happening on the edges. Yeah. So we, let's say we have here uh, 20 companies who, in our audience who would like to be part of Betaworks, who would love to be part of Betaworks. Um, what do they need to do to, to grab your attention, to get you interested in them? Um, so, you know, first and foremost is that we have a, we have a sector focus, right? We are focused on this intersection of real-time data with the social cloud. It's all, everything we do is end-user facing. We don't do any enterprise stuff. We, everything, all the companies we work with really ultimately f serving and finding users, end users. So B2B, all of that is, is just outside of our scope. So there's a very sort of upfront, there's a reasonably tight filter. Um, and then beyond that is that we have sort of two ways which we interface with companies. In, is one is, is that we build things and we've bought a few things. We bought two companies um, or bought majority in two companies. Um, and then the second is we've done seed investments. And when we do seed investments, we are, um, we're always first money in. We're doing small investments in the sort of $100,000 range. Um, and um, we are you know, part of the, the seed investing team. And so if you, if, you look at, uh, if you look at our website, we've got a handful of things which we really view as core platforms. And those things we either building um, out, and those include um, uh, Bitly and TweetDeck and Twitter feed and Choppy and, um, and Tumblr and Twitter. I think those are all the ones in Superfeed actually, which we announced yesterday. Um, and then, uh, and then we have, then we view the world in sort of, you know, buckets of, um, of categories, sort of vertical categories. So entertainment, finance, you know, in entertainment, there's, oh my God, pop, some e-cards, those were all seed investments. And we, we really look more like a seed investor to those companies on the periphery. In the center, we're actually active and operating many of those companies on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, so one of those is TweetDeck, as you said. Yeah. And I understand that you guys have some new features that you're rolling out. Uh, Tim, I think, saw a preview of the new list features and was really wowed by them. So I'm not sure how much you can talk about, but can you tell us a little bit about what might have wowed him, what, what's important? Sure. TweetDeck's doing. Sure. So there is, um, uh, uh, Tim saw it last night, and um, Ian, the founder and CEO of TweetDeck, has, um, has blogged about it. We've got a new version which is coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, TweetDeck, it's funny, what Ian said to me yesterday, we, TweetDeck's been around, I think, for 16 months, and I asked him how many versions he had had. I think that this will be 100 plus. So the degree of innovation and competitiveness in the, in the Twitter client space is remarkable. Um, TweetDeck is leading Twitter client. We got, depending on measure, it's somewhere between 12 and 17 percent of Twitter usage on TweetDeck. Um, we're, we're doing great with TweetDeck. The focus of the next round of features is going to be lists. And so uh, TweetDeck innovated in the groups. It was the first to have groups. Um, and so we grouped categories, which you could have columns as groups. We're now syncing up those groups with Twitter lists, and we're going to offer a whole bunch of new functionality around that to basically help you construct, navigate, and manage that. And uh, that's what Tim saw last night, and that's what we're going to get out as soon as we darn can. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, well, it's exciting to hear that Twitter, the Twitter innovations then support new innovation in the ecosystem, that it doesn't just mean they start taking on the functions that the clients have had so far. For right, example. right. So um, let's talk a little bit about Bitly. We just have another minute to go here, but um, I think they're a really important player in the web as it's emerging, um, a new way of sharing information. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about new features they've just announced. They have some analytics yeah. um, that they've built on recently. Yeah, so would, you know, Bitly is uh, Bitly has become sort of a, I think, a part of this uh, new emerging platform. Um, it is, um, it's, it's growing like insanely fast. So you know, I think yesterday there were 80, 85 million Bitly links that were clicked on around the web, um, which is remarkable because back in January there were about 10 million in the whole month. So 85 million in a day. So, um, so Bitly has, you know, Anil had that quote up from Ev about scaling. You know, Bitly has scaled um, and, and is scaling to big, big numbers. Last week, we pushed out um, uh, the aggregated user stats on a, on a weekly basis and so that you could see your sort of top clicks um, and have a view of that. 
um, in, um, in about 20 or 18 days, we'll have top month. And what we're waiting for is actually a month's worth of rolling data. Um, so once we got the data, it'll be there. So you'll see the monthly data in there. And then there's a set of new features uh, where we can really show you top bits across everything, which are going to be coming out um, hopefully shortly. It's a big data set to manage a bitly now, which is a, a wonderful problem to have. Yeah. Uh, well, I wish we had more time to talk about it because I think it's fascinating. But we are done, so we'll have to have you back another time. John, thank you so much. Thanks.